Cantaloupe Jones presents a home video preview. Psst! Want to solve a mystery? Then listen up. Because Cantaloupe Jones has clues to the most suspenseful, intriguing, and dubious mysteries ever put on tape. Jack Murphy's a man of wit, guile, and impeccable panache. His accomplices are level-headed Roger Clark and cunning Alan Kuhn. Ready your magnifying glass. Other great whodunits to be seen ahead in the bootleg Betamax tapes collection that will make your head turn. Each video contains a special case with a secret puzzle or closed book that will let you try to outsmart recorded history. The case includes exhibit of clues, unsolved problem, assembling of the information, and motives. It's a unique interactive concept. New from Cantaloupe Jones. So go ahead. Match wits with the world's greatest operatives. Set your private eyes on Cantaloupe Jones Bootleg Betamax Collection. Companies, a tip it to curb the rising power of dogs. But hell them ain't check until 1880s. One incident in the which the six companies met with success and occurred in 1862. They fought against the legal prostitution and made efforts to send a band of soy girls back to the old country. The success was noticed uh, praised by the state legislature, but uh, attempts to send back these girls sometimes were thwarted by American businessmen with vested interests in the Chinatown Red White District. In such failure, they tried on numerous occasions for the United States and China to work on an extradition treaty that would send many of the criminal Buhudua or hatchet men back to China. Upon the criminal offense was denied by the United States, many politicians and California viewed the sick companies with this by the sex. But we think that they had despotic powers and that they had usurped some of the very powers of the local governments, such as the belief the six companies held their own trials, had control gambling, as well as affected their own punishments against those who the court deemed guilty. The six companies battled the tar for 50 years, and while moderately successful from 1850 to 1870, the criminal element began to grow exponentially around 1880. The six companies was a paternal order that set up the rules and regulations of the society without consenting to the will of the people in exchange for security and protection. Fortune most gold if do as told. Torch and candle, wax and wick, do not cross mountain. Pomp say be mindful, do not trust thoughts. Someone hear what you think, like flower hid by the reef. You will find answer. Mice only play when cat's supposed to be in bed. <laughs> <laughs> 
too mysterious swiddle in your bloodline, buried between two oak trees, with of the village you go up. Move quick. Travel five day with Silver Star at your heel. Cross Raging River. There will we rise true self. Beware me with gears. Speak not to sea or sudden wind. Not all fogs impart. Beware them. Quark in water. Man is quiet. Where we is far. And everything fine. For to wish. To make more wish. To crumble. When water fall. Stone remain. that witching hour and if you've just been completely terrified out of your wits can i remind you before we leave that the program carries on now in much less sinister vein with narrator chi yong around midnight on some of the merchants involved in the chinatown quarters of america then after one o'clock we'll be presenting something more suitable for night owls that's on tongs tonight now, from Kenilworth Jones, that's just about all. And we wish you a very good night. Good night. Excuse me, General. Uh oh. Bring them in. Yes, sir. Take 
group together to be able to form a single cohesive group to fight against the bigotry, violence, or decrees they deemed infringing upon the white Sioux. The Sig companies were at first known as the Kong Chow Company. The Sigs were the Sam Yup Company, the Si Yup Company, the Nin Young Company, the Nin Wo Company, the Hop Wo Company, and the Hip Cop Company. The six companies could be divided into two groups based on dialects as well. The Sam Yups spoke the Cantonese dialect. The more numerous Si Yups spoke the more common tongue of Du Pong Gai. 1850s, the California Gold Rush brought a wave of Chinese immigrants to the United States. Approximately 25,000 Chinese immigrants left their homes in search for Gam San, Golden Mountain, and California. Our kin is claimed to have arrived in the area 1850s. He is the first Chinese person credited as having permanently immigrated to Chinatown as a Cantonese businessman. Ah Kin eventually founded a successful cigar store on Park Road. He then arrived around 58 in New York City, where he was probably one of those Chinese mentioned in Gossip of the 1860s as peddling awful cigar at three cents apiece. From with a stand along the City Hall Park fence, offering a paper spill and tiny oil lamp as a writer. In New York, immigrant found work as cigar men or carrying billboards. And our kids' particular success encouraged cigar maker William Wangford, John Aku, and John Aba to also ply the trade. Eventually, Forming a monopoly cigar trade. He had the bins back waited. That it may have been our kid who kept a small potting house on a row of Mott Street suit and the uh, rented out bunk suit to the first Chinese immigrant to, to arrive in Chinatown. It was with the first profit he owned, earning an average of 100 per month, that he was able to open his park a row smoke shop around which modern-day Chinatown will grow. The term itself, Chinatown, was first used by the New York Times in 1880 to describe an area defined by three streets that still form at its heart, Mott, Pear, and Doyas. Mott Street it is referred as the street and one day where Rocky Luciano grew up and eventually was to power. In the Godfather Part 2, the Dinko Auto Oil Company was located on Mars Street in a once upon a time in Mayaku, a Chinese man helped a noodle by the dinero escape the old man trying to kill him by directing him to run to a door face Mall Street. There, down a Mall Street. Go, go, go. Say the man of Koji Noodle, hurry up. Uh, David Cornered Super Film Naked Watch. The pick of uh, William A. Burrow, notorious character, Doc Billy, as having an office to, uh, for a while. 1032 Mod Street, New York, from which the dog dispensed a cocktail of perfume and ground back centipede to film protagonist William Wade. 
Mortal Street is a narrow but busy thoroughfare. One through north south direction in the New York City borough of Manhattan Zoo. Regard it as Chinatown unofficial main street. Mortal Street run through Boyka Street in north of Chatham Square in the south. It is a one way street with a southbound running vehicle traffic only. Mall Street exists in current configuration by me 18th century. Mata Street passed through east of Correct Pond. Correct Park today is three block west to Center Street. Like a mini street to depredated Manhattan to grid. Mata Street meandered all around natural world features. Of the landscapes uh, rather than running through them or over them. It was the need to avoid the not long since paved over correct part and gave mostly characteristic bend to the northeast at the Pearl Street. Had been bend no basically Old Street as well as Benny Street, also spelled Benny. Otto Street was a renamed in late 18th century to honor the prominent local family of the same name, particular businessman Joseph Malt, a butcher and tavern owner who provided support to the Weber forces in the American Revolution. 19th century, the lower portion of Malt Street, south of Canal Street, was the part of the Five Points, notorious swamp neighborhood in Wellwood, Manhattan. And 1872, Wu Qi, a Chinese merchant, opened a general store on the Mall Street near Pear Street. In other years to follow, Chinese immigrants too would hop out an area around into Saisu of Mort Doya and Pa Streets. At the time, it was a mostly Chinese male who were immigrated. And what was Pupaka Chinatown began a very, very small bachelor society. Most of these immigrants were from Taishan, southwest of Guangdong, so as a result, it was originally a Thai Chinese community that all changed during the 60s when the influx of Cantonese immigrants from Hong Kong and Taiwan began arriving as well. Chinatown began expanding quickly and our standard Cantonese, which was spoken in China and Hong Kong, became a language over the neighborhood. At this time, he started emerging as a little Hong Kong, but the growth swelled down later on. Chinatown has since grown into largest Chinatown in the United States. In the thin wide swath of the Lower East Side, Little Guangdong or Kani Town would be more appropriate terms in Cantonese immigrant to come from different parts of Guangdong province. By 1903, there were four Chinese restaurants established such as Port Arthur, Tuxedo, Imperial, and Chinese Quay Lunch on Mall Street. Other areas Chinese restaurants existed such as Chain Door Street and Savoy Oriental Street on Pear Street. These two estates are fine in competition with each other in the Chinatown community. In 1907, the Chinese Tuxedo Restaurant opened as a high-class Chinese milk restaurant. Outside of the restaurant entrance to were Kawasso Chinese style awning, which were crowned with a large wooden carved Chinese dragon. There was a multi-colored stained glass sign 
with the world west want only they will put a picture of a this entrance and uh, they will uh, then distribute it to customer of uh, this west one for a free west one was located on a balcony with a carved teak wood panel that uh, seem to be but from a west building with the purpose of uh, getting people attention to it storming through the street there were often many American commerce in this Westwald. Inside the Westwald, Mosaic Air Force and Prestige Sealing will chant with and was dragging around the dark room they play potty plants surrounding a water fountain which contained wooden birds support by wooden dragon style Ooh. make the west one appearing and also feng shui under the table tops were made in way marble they were teak wood in skin behind the fountain with a handu carved on the ball wood molding that was used as a warm divider with coating set up on them the restaurant also had a private dining room and display a man advertisement. So and important ice cream, including English and Chinese menu. As a way to remind customers, this restaurant is not located in China and located in America. The unarmed staff with chicken, lobster, and ham cost two dollars on the menu. At the time, uh, they were on our way to try and well, conveniently next to the location. The Port of Westwatt was also established in 1897 and operated more than 85 years. Chugam Fai was the original owner who started the business uh, named after Port Arthur, now Lushun a city on the northeastern China coast where in 1904 to 1905 the siege of Port Arthur marked the first victory of Asian power over European power were located on the second and third floor of 79 Mall Street entrance two restaurants were marked by ornate pagoda style awning and building Chinese pagoda style balcony will eventually become a trademark Eventually, an escalator was established in the West Arm to make it easier for customers to access the second and third floors where customers were seated. The Port Arthur was the first Chinese restaurant in New York City, Chinatown. To obtain a liquor license, the restaurant was known for the delicious Chinese style dishes and delicacy. And well for its authentic Chinese style wall deco, pearl mahogany table, teak wood chair, ornate carved wooden panel, windscreens, phantom, chandeliers, the third floor dining room were reserved for private party and banquet, where many local Chinese residents held wedding party and family ceremonial dinner. East Hall Upper Dining Room had Baby Grand Piano for entertainment and by 1910 it was redesigned to accommodate the Wall Banquet Tables. The West Hall Upper Dining Room had no walls or screens to divide the space and each table was set up with only four seats to accommodate smaller groups. There were also special upper floor for bride's traditional change into different wear dresses for various stages of a team reception. The second floor dining area was for smaller group of customers or after hour swimmers, American tourists in search for exotic adventures. A special luncheon on the lower dining floor every day from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. except for holidays and Sundays. The restaurant was very conveniently located near an elevated train at James Square and a subway station at Worth Street. But while Port Arthur restaurant, there was a store named Soaki Company, importer and exporter 
of Chinese good, selling curio, China wear, wops, Chinese silk, embroidery, ivory carving, imported Chinese tea, candy su, dry food, coffee, canned food su, kimono, pajamas, other type of accessories. Soiki, the company were originally located on 36 Pell Street, then moved to Ma Street. In 1897, eventually moved outside of the Chinatown neighborhood. In 1891, a Chinese man named Luo Kui opened up the Ma Street General Store. This was a gathering place for the earliest Chinese immigrants to socialize and maintain the kin roots with family and friends. It was very specially important because Chinatown was made up primarily of men. Chinese men were not allowed to bring the family to America. The Chinese women that were there most often prostitutes. too. Uh, if they arrived, it was probably a growing task to keep them. Is more a hobby than a habit. You need tools to keep the carbon down, to shift obstructions, and for general maintenance. Oldest Chinese door I will make in the neighborhood for more than a century. Bong Yin Chin and Ko. Okay. On 32 Mall Street, the architectural design where we change with some of the original Romanians. Carved arch above counter, form of painting of Chinese women hanging on wall. And visual quark from when shop first opened, still ticking. The apothecary shelf that display traditional style of Chinese white bowl, tea set and J Dragon still remain as well. Brother, the Jade Statue is <laughs> Brother. Brother. You know well today to get this statuette. Car with woodwork around the counter is where herbal women were once sold. Chop Sui, a flavorable phone together store fry. May be earliest Chinese American dish, which I made featuring country noodle, is coarse flour. Perfect example of medicinal cobbled together cuisine might be egg foo yang, a wok fried omelet full of Chinese vegetable, sometimes meat or seafood, smothered in European style brown gravy, and plunked on top of fluffy pregnant porridge rice. Chinese Megu cuisine evolved in 1970. Uh, Dana in Westmont, a chitty, regional Chinese cooking, important local kitchen, old fashioned menu they were with on a in New York City neighborhood, carry out restaurants, and in handful of old places found on original park, a hot Chinatown, like Pop Key and Wo Hop. Even though the patron were often non Chinese, a powerful fascination for Chinatown opium dance. Uptana began to engage in a practice called swimming. This popular pastime was essentially class tourism. Sightseeing in impoverished neighborhood, how the poor lived. The swimmer came to Chinatown with intent to stare at the motorcycles and the tour open dance, which was summertime a fake, and the open stayed up to eat and shop. Chinese 
Number time referred to oh, as molasses. That's swank. Particular Chinese American cuisine. Well, developing in America, a stink for general fair places like Guangzhou and Kazan, where many immigrants come from. It began with mining camp and transcontinental railroad cooks who, who were forcefully used to work on vegetables, or dry the seafood, and a candle ingredient. And of Francisco, to construct some semblance of food of a home, substituting shredded cabbage for bean sprouts. The evolution continued as Sabi cook reformulated this shoe. 20th century dawn, Chinese restaurants were increasingly patronized by non Chinese diner, and white people stopped frequenting opium den together. Make a fall. A totally dangerous night on town where one could easily get more or were taken advantage of by the fast talking, hard to understand, and the street smart hustlers. <laughs> Chinese merchant, as a rule, was strictly honest in other business dealings, and this kind of surety. Pain to self-sufficiency, responsible or soften it, which demonstrate a high work ethic and motivation to pull themselves and their family to gain a fortune. So motivation doing temporary stay in America and white reactionary blind disdain a Chinese made difficult to do well in the unfriendly environment. Pushing at them to work together and even when breaking the wall. Original tensions uh, were there to improve the situation and to good for their people. Yeah. The bit in Doyer Street became known as Murder Alley or Bloody Angle because of numerous killings among the Tong gangs of Chinatown that lasted to the 30s. The secret getaway route to Mott Street through underground passageways. Hatchets were frequently used. More people died violently at Bloody Angle than any other street intersection in the United States. One shooting at the Chinese theater in 1905 claimed the lives of three people when members of the Hip Sing Tong fired on members of the On Long Tong. The shooting took place at a time when the theater was packed with 400 people. In one 1909 incident, two members of the On Long Tong were shot, one fatally, by members of the rival Four Brothers Society, or Si Sing Tong. The shooting came after three members of the Hip Sing Tong were executed in Boston for the murder of a member of the On Long Tong. The collapse of the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association came about when the Geary Act passed, 
as it was the one true occasion when the companies pressured the whole community to protest it by not registering, as well as donating a dollar each for the employment of lawyers to fight for their rights. The leader of the opposition to the Gary Act was Chun Ti Chu, and when the six companies lost the battle against the act, and many U.S. officials pointed out the six companies had informed their members to violate laws of the United States. Both Chun Ti Chu and the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association had taken a huge loss to face to their society. Quickly, the Tongs published that they would pay $300 for Chun's head. Chun Ti Chu was not deterred and continued his fight against the Tongs. Immediately after the severe loss of face, the prestige for the six companies in their protest of the Gary Act in 1893 through 1894, the Chinese criminal element finally burst its seams and the Tong Wars erupted onto the streets of Chinatown. The criminal elements of the Tongs eventually either found it more profitable to participate in illicit activities, or the criminal elements of the Tong wrestled power away. Tongs attempted to corner the market on criminal activities, especially anything that would bring in a nice profit, such as prostitution, opium, gambling, and forcing Chinese merchants to pay protection fees. Dr. Wong, Dr. Wong. Oh, Mr. Chen. Long time. How are you? How's business? Hey. People tell me that those gangsters have been attacking the gym and Mr. Kent got beaten up and hurt real bad. I don't think you should involve yourself in this. They're big trouble. Those gangsters, they might even take... That's right. Be cold-blooded killers. Oh, the rheumatism's oh, come worry. again. Come back with me. I'll give you some medicine. Oh, Dr. Wang, you're a good man. You were so kind to us. You know that? We're all the same <laughs> family, you and I. Come on, come on. Those men are bandits. You see? Look how they hurt you. Uh, they hit real hard. <laughs> One interesting aspect of the Tongs was that each organization had two to three fluent English speakers who served a variety of functions for the Tong, skimming local newspapers for mentions of their group so they could inform their fellow members. They also dealt with the foreigner lawyers and Americans if the need arose. In 1887, membership numbers varied from as few as 50 to as many as 1,500 members. It was common for a tongue to split. When it accumulated too many members, one problem that was common throughout the period that would aid in the breakout of wars between the tongues was that some members could be a member of six tongs at any one time so that if that member was killed in a war one of the other tongs he was a member of would and sometimes did seek revenge by declaring war a unique aspect of the Chikong tong was that their members used euphemisms to direct their members. For example, to order a kill on somebody was to wash his body. <laughs> a rifle was called a dog and a pistol was suitably nicknamed a puppy. Bullets and ammo, dog feed. When the leader wished for his men to fire, he shouted, let the dogs bark. Usually, one tong specialized in a specific illegal activity, although some even had legitimate businesses, and some had both. 
the Bosan Seer Tong, which ran many gambling dens, also had grocery stores under their ownership. The Hua Ting San Fang and the An Yik Tong were said to specialize in the brothels, with the Kuang Duk Tong and the An Long Tong specializing in sex trafficking of women. Gambling dens was left to the Hipsing Tong. Most initiation ceremonies were not as elaborate as the first known Tong organizations had, as the Qigong Tong was quite traditional in its aspect, with the counts stating that the group still used many triad symbols and signs. While uncertain as to whether or not other Tongs adhered to this characteristic as well, but the Qigong Tong headquarters would not observe Chinese holidays and would only fly their flag full mast when it was a Tong holiday or when war was on the horizon. The Hatchet Men, also known to outsiders of the Chinatown as high binders, they would bind their queue on top of their heads to prevent them from being grabbed by an opponent, the salaried soldiers of the Tongs. These soldiers most likely were from the Chinese lower classes, as many were uneducated and less motivated to become a law-abiding citizen of any country. Allegedly, 20% of each of the Tongs membership population was said to be the professional soldiers, known to Chinese as Bu Hao Doi. These men formed the specialized muscle of the Tong and usually carried out their missions with precision and fearlessness. It is said that many hatchet men just prior to an assassination mission or battle with the rival Tong would consume wildcat meat in hopes that they would temporarily acquire the reflexes and sight of the animal. The Bu Hao Doi used a variety of weapons to accomplish their bloody deeds, ranging from small knives to hatchets, by far their favorite melee weapon in the close quarter department. And they seem to have taken a particular fondness to the Colt 45 revolver for their longer range needs. The axe that the highbinders used was somewhat modified from what one usually thinks of a hatchet as they would cut much of the handle off to have a good grip and cut a hole into it. The hatchet men were also known to use many different materials as body armor with varying success. These hatchet men had written contracts that specified their responsibilities. In the discharge of your duties, you are slain. This Tong undertakes to pay $500 sympathy money to your friends. An upcoming conflict would be signaled by the appearance of wildcat meat at Chinese butchers. Hatchet men believed eating wildcat meat would give them superior eyesight and reflexes. Tong wars were fought not only on the streets and alleys, but also on the rooftops, which goes back to Kwang Duk with the Golden Peach. Other reasons were control of gambling, opium, and prostitution, but literally anything could begin a war. Whether one Tong lacked full pay to another Tong for a slave girl, as in the case of the Bing Hong Tong and Hua Xin San Fan Tong War, or simply because of limited number of Chinese women. Like Hop Sing Tong, Sui Sing Tong War. Other Tong Wars started due to issues from defamation of a rival Tong's face to attempting to take another Tong's business. The Bing On Tong Hua Sin San Fan Tong War was caused when Bing On sold the girl to a Hua Ting member, but he did not pay the full amount specified, and the Bing On's demanded that the bill be paid. The Hua Ting's replied that
that the girl was not even worth $500, and if they wanted to do something about it, they were welcome to try at their own risk. A fight over a cat in 1898 led to a war between Bing Kung Tong and the Hip Sing Tong. The Hop Sing Tong Sui Sing Tong War was particularly bloody. By the time a truce was signed, four Hop Sings lay dead and four more were wounded compared to the Sui Sings two dead, one wounded. Even though the truce was signed, they went back to war two more times. One time being of a three month duration in 1900 which produced even deadlier results. Seven dead in total, eight wounded, and not a single murderer captured by police. The other each killed one member of the other group, and the Hop Sings attempted to dynamite their rival's headquarters. Sure, the tobacco industry stopped using cartoon characters, but have they stopped advertising to kids? Who do you think this is for? And with cigarettes that bend like toys, and cool games like Find the Logo, has the tobacco industry really stopped advertising to kids? Or is it just getting smarter? You might decide to change your hair, if everyone else did. You might decide to get a tattoo, if everyone else did. You might even decide to smoke pot, if everyone else did. Well, guess what? Not everyone else does. <laughs> My doppelganger is much less fit for this occupation. You will find. I'm a different opponent altogether. Very well. Prepare to die. The Tongs went to war with one another and brought their allies with them. Such was the case in the Bolong Tong Bo An Tong War. With the Bolong supporters on Yik Tong and Opsing Tong to do battle against the Bo An as well as their supporters, Sui Sing Tong and Hip Sing Tong. Another example would be the Hua Ting Song Fang Tong and the Sin Sui Ying Tong, allying with the Hop Sing to fight the Sui Sing Tong. The Chinese population of the San Francisco Chinatown dropped dramatically during this turbulent era from as many as 25,000 to only 14,000 by the beginning of 1900 with the Chinese U.S. population dropping by 16% during this time. Never throughout the Tong Wars did a single Tong gain supremacy over all others, considering that any member could be a part of up to six Tongs. There were many cases similar to how one Hop Sing killed a member of the hip sings but he also turned out to be a prominent member of the Sin Sui Ying Tong so they then joined the fray later in that same war a Sin Sui Ying member went to go curse a Hop Sing member then was ambushed in the temple and mortally wounded which then brought the Chi Kong into the mix as that man was a member of their Tong as well The hatchet men were all either aging or dead, and the ones left would go with their tongs to other cities, such as New York, Chicago, Seattle, and Los Angeles. Tong wars between Chinese gangs continued for 25 years in New York and left loads of people as corpses piled up in Manhattan. Tom Lee was the most powerful Chinese immigrant at the time ambitious cunning man who came to America when he was 14 having been born in Guangzhou 
He was sent to New York by the Sick Companies, Supreme Governing Body, Fraternal Organization in the United States, was an umbrella group of different agencies with the authority of the Six Companies. Tom Lee was effectively put in charge of the Chinese community in New York in the 1870s. He was a charismatic member of the community. He realized the value of connections outside his neighborhood, especially at City Hall and the police department. Tom Lee courted them with gifts, and in September 1881, he arranged a picnic on Staten Island for 50 Chinese residents and a handful of invited and influential guests. He became known as the Mayor of Mont Street and was the most important figure of the Chinese community. In the year 1880, Tom Lee founded his new organization, the Lu Yi Tong, whose name translates as Chamber United in Friendship, a mixture of trade union, fraternity, and activism group that served as a sort of Chinese Masonic Lodge. The initiation ritual involved suspending a sword over a recruit's head as he recited 36 oaths of allegiance. His finger was pricked and a drop of blood was put into some wine which was drunk by all in the room to symbolize brotherhood. Loyalty and obedience were valued above all else. By 1884, Tom Lee was running 16 gambling establishments in Little China, the precursor to Chinatown. Gamblers paid $8 per table per week, with the third going to him and the rest to the police. Lee also made money from using his police contacts to keep cops away from opium dens or giving the owners a warning they were about to be raided. He was also not afraid that rivals killed if it suited them. The Chinatown squad found it difficult to prevent such wars or to apprehend the highbinders who, when pursued, would disappear into Chinatown's dark alleys. That's when the police turned to harsh and unconstitutional methods. In 1891, the head of the squad, Sergeant Bill Price, told Chief Patrick Crowley that to defeat the Tonks, it would be necessary to go beyond present laws. Price proposed to carry out violent raids on all the Tong headquarters, a blatantly illegal tactic that Crowley agreed upon only after the Chinese Consul General gave his approval. Officers identified the criminal talks and raided 20 of them in one day. We got 16 men in uniform and a surgeon had supplied them all with axes. We marched from one to another of these societies and literally cut them to pieces. Did not leave a piece of furniture five inches long in one of them. Such rough tactics outraged some Chinatown residents, but they succeeded in temporarily suppressing Tong violence after the most notorious Tong slaying, the 1897 murder of Tong leader Little Pete. The Chinese consul criticized police for discontinuing the raids. He admitted that police stormed innocent people's homes and businesses. By the early 20th century, Tongs were found in nearly every major American city, eventually incorporating prostitution, gambling, drug trade, and racketeering. Tongs became the preeminent Asian organized crime network in the country.
silver dart. A secret weapon. Who, who are you? I am who, Maniac. You better bear that in mind. I would not want you to enter the gates of hell without even knowing who helped you get there. I've never even met you. Why did you attack me? Are you really that damn stupid? Do you realize what weapon she attacked you with? Poison pin. You'll be dead in a matter of a very, very few seconds. However, if you leave the Kwanghua, perhaps I can help you. I can give you the antidote. <laughs> I'm not afraid of the poison pin. Even if I am going to die right now, I'd prefer to go with dignity. It was Dom Leeds, other gank, the odd log dog, and the hip seam dog, its bitter rival, that would cause the first of the talk wars. The Hipsing organization made a fortune from smuggling people into the U.S. for $200 each trip and were also known as the High Binders. One report from the time said they were a famous secret society of thugs and murderers who haunt the dirty basements. The Hipsing's labor organization led by young Mock Duck, who claimed to have been born in San Francisco. While Tom Lee had always paid some of his earnings from gambling to the police and politicians, the hip Sing Tom kept it all for themselves and were far more greedy. Tom Lee was also the head of La Lockdown, which operated out of Mott Street in New York's Chinatown. Established November 1893, Lock fought a violent war for control of Chinatown's rackets and business with the Hips Inc. In recent years, the Tom been linked. The Ghost Shadows Street Gang, led by Wing Young John. Currently, there are over 30,000 registered online members, majority of them commercial or industrial background. The onlongs were selling protection from the police. The hip sinks were selling protection from themselves. Mock Duck was said to be slim and delicate, almost girlish in demeanor. But his appearance camouflaged how he had the spirit of a tiger. Carrying two handguns, along with the hand axe, ready to brandish, always concealed in his sleeve. Mock Duck survived stabbings and shootings and began wearing a chainmail vest under his clothes. Known for his terrible aim with the gun, soon realized his best chance against the hatchet men was to stoop to the ground, duck his head, shut his eyes, and shoot two pistols in any direction he pleased. Using this method, Mock Duck rarely failed to hit his attacker, but often innocent bystanders as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 